Hi everybody, you're watching theCUBE's coverage of RSA 2023. We're here at Moscone West. This is day four, it's, the week has flown by, I don't know, 40, maybe even close to 50,000 people this week in San Francisco. We're really excited to have Al Yogev, who is the CEO and co-founder of Anjuna Security, and Arv Arvid Raghu, who's the worldwide business development and go-to-market strategy lead for EC2 Core Confidential Computing at AWS. Cube alums, good to see you again. Thanks so much for coming back on. Thank you for having me on. Thanks what for having event, us. Huh? We're back to 2019 levels, it feels like. I mean, yeah. maybe even more. I mean, there's more excitement, more startups, you know, <laughs> yeah. more people. It's, uh, it's good, it's good to be back, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. RSA is always like a big reunion. It's fun to see everybody, you know, people that I've worked with throughout the years. It's always a super fun event. It's incredible, you go out at night and you see people you haven't seen in a while. I just saw another friend of mine that I used to work with at IDC. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah. We just see <laughs> it's really like, you know, good old, good old week. Um, Al, why don't we start with then, Juno. Why did you start the company? What were the roots? Yeah, thanks, thanks for asking. Uh, so, so my background has always been in security. I've been doing that for over 20 years. And what I love about security is that the best security solutions are enablers. Right, they enable you to do something that you couldn't do without the confidence and trust that security provides. And just uh, one example is uh, the firewall. The firewall is what enabled organizations to connect their internal networks to the internet for the first time. They wouldn't have done it without a firewall. Uh, and when I ran into confidential computing, uh, which is what we based the company on, it was very clear to me that this was going to be the next big enabler in security. And it essentially enables organizations to take their data and their workloads and run it in any environment with complete security and privacy and the first thing we're seeing now is this enables uh, cloud transformation. Organizations can take their most sensitive data, any workload, and run it in the cloud. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, I wrote a piece a while ago, called, if you just Google it, AWS is a secret weapon, it'll come right up. And, so like, and then, it was really all about Nitro, and, and it was certainly Graviton was part of that, but the Annapurna relationship, Arvid, that, you know, started, it's really interesting, the history of AWS and its you know, EC2 and other sort of semiconductor design prowess, but, but, but I learned a lot last year at Reinforce when we first met, just about your perspectives on confidential computing. I'd say you guys were sort of, you know, with Nitro Enclaves, really ahead of the game. Others have now sort of, sort of copied that, which is good. That's a, that's a good thing. But what, how would you summarize your perspectives on, on confidential computing? Sure, uh, let's first define what confidential computing is so our, our listeners know what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, depending on who you talk to, the definition changes a lot, but I think there's one thing everybody agrees on, confidential computing is about protecting data in use from any access. And you know, everything we build is, is based on our conversations with customers. And based on our conversations there, there are two distinct security and privacy dimensions that we have identified that pertain to confidential computing. Dimension one is where we're protecting customer code and data from operators on the cloud provider side. In this case, that's AWS. So if you're running on EC2 today, there's just no operator access from AWS to reach into your code or data that's running on the instance. That by default is satisfying one dimension of confidential computing already. So if you're running a Nitro-based instance, from our perspective, we are already providing confidential computing by default. Now, if you are looking to further isolate that code and data, if you're running sensitive data, not all data is created equal. There's innocuous data and sensitive data. If you're running sensitive data and you want to protect it even from yourselves, that's really when a solution like Nitro Enclaves comes into play because it's providing additional isolation on top of what you're getting on a Nitro-based instance. And that satisfies dimension two, where you're concerned about protecting code and data from yourself. That's our perspective, our definition, how we look at confidential computing. And everything that we have built has been based on working backwards from customer requirements here. You know, <laughs> I've, I've heard some, what I considered ridiculous arguments where somebody says, so I get it, you got to protect you know, from yourself, but then protect from, for instance, Amazon. They said, well, why don't you trust Amazon? I'm like, okay, but if, if the Amazon's protecting it, it's impossible for them to get to it, why wouldn't I take that if it's coming for free? Yeah. So I, I heard that as a criticism of confidential computing one time. I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Thank you for doing it. <laughs> and yes, I trust you, but even better, I trust you more now. Right? So, <laughs> Thank you. And I, but, but here's the thing, like you got to trust somebody in the process, right? That the, we are all trending towards zero trust, but it's an asymptotic curve. We're, we'll get there at some point, but right now we're not there. You got to trust somebody in the chain. Yeah, well, this idea of making security sort of an accelerant even to your business or an enabler. Yep. I think a lot of people might say that, nah, security's all about risk reduction, you know, lowering my expected loss. 
How can security become an enabler? Give us your perspectives on that. Yeah, so specifically when it comes to computational computing, uh, when we talk to large organizations like banks, for example, roughly what we're seeing is that you know, 10 to 15% of the workloads are already in the cloud. About 10 to 15% will probably never move to the cloud. But then you have these sort of 70 to 80% of workloads that they want to move to the cloud. There's a, there's a lot of benefits to moving to the cloud. There's scalability, there's access to services that exist in the cloud. There's a lot of reason why you want to move something to the cloud, but it's being blocked. And basically security and privacy is the number, you know, number one and number two reasons why the, this uh, moves are blocked, and it's concerns around you know, data sovereignty, concerns about the privacy of the data. It could be uh, PII data of customers, you know, personal identified data of customers. Um, so, so if you have the right security solutions where you don't have these concerns anymore, then security becomes an enabler. Then you can take the 70 and 80% of workload that you want to move to the cloud but are being blocked, and security becomes an enabler. So, so really is the use case that we're going to talk about here is, is moving data from on-prem into the cloud that you want to put into the cloud, but exactly. you can't because it's not, why? Because it's not encrypted, you're not protecting data in motion, is that right? Can you explain that? Yeah, so the, the number one reason is, and it's what Arvin basically mentioned, is once you, the, the core sort of difference of the cloud versus on-prem is that the cloud is essentially somebody else managing the infrastructure for you. Right, on on-prem, it's, you know, it's your building, it's your servers, it's your people, you have control of the full stack, and even then, sometimes you don't want your admins to have access to your data, so it's to some extent true on-prem, but in the cloud, it's even worse because it's a third party that's managing it. And you know, for banks, they worry about what happens if the government comes in with a subpoena and a gag order, like can they get access to my data? What happens if the cloud provider gets access to my data? You have third parties running on the same servers. So there's a lot of security and privacy questions that people have, uh, and that's exactly where if you have the right solution, where access to the infrastructure doesn't mean access to the data anymore, that it just solves these concerns and enables those cloud migrations. And, and, and is, it, is, it, is the hard part the data in motion or is it the full sort of spectrum? So, so it's, it's fine, the hard part has actually always been the data in use. So data in motion is now pretty much solved. You can, you can encrypt it using HTTPS. Uh, data at rest is solved. You can encrypt data when it's in a database or the file system. But the one piece that was always unprotected was data in use. Right. What happens when the application needs to process the data and it decrypts it, loads it into memory, and at that point it's completely accessible. And, and to some extent that was, uh, th that is sort of the core of why that access to infrastructure gives you access to data. Even if you encrypt everything, the data sits in the clear in memory, and the, the keys, the encryption keys, have to sit somewhere on the infrastructure. So if you have access to the infrastructure, you have access to the keys and therefore to everything. Once you close that gap, then finally you have full security and full privacy on top of your environment. So the architecture isolates pretty much everything, right? Whereas, the, maybe explain how you know, traditional virtualization architectures were established and then what's different? In that's a, that's like a well-informed question, by the way. <laughs> and uh, with the Nitro system, what we've done, as you, as you pointed out already, traditional virtualization versus what we did with the Nitro system, is we abstracted away a lot of the virtualization functions, if you will, from the host with the Nitro system. And we moved it away from the host and, and uh, functions like networking and storage and device models, management, security, all of that were pulled away from the actual EC2 host itself and sits on separate PCIe cards on a Nitro system. And that is isolated from the actual host which is running the virtual machines which are your instances. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's running on the host is in addition to all, the, all of that is just the Nitro hypervisor which is a very light hypervisor which takes care of ring fencing these virtual machines. And that provides isolation between different tenants, and it also provides additional isolation that we talked about with something like Nitro Enclaves. So that's the isolation model we built. But let's not get hung up on isolation, right? Because how we do it does not matter. What matters more is what we do for our customers. And what we're doing here is providing that end-to-end -end protection that I talked about, right? There are three things you do with data. You store data, you move data, you process data. The, the protection for storing data and moving data, that's existed for a while. Mm -hmm. What we are now doing is extending that protection for data in use. Once it comes into the memory, and once it gets unpacked, and plain text is revealed, how are you protecting it, who are you protecting it from? That's really what matters. But sure, yes, the ni Nitro system itself provides that isolation, that's a very strong isolation model we built, and then everything else, is a combination of both isolation and encryption. And the only entities <coughs> that can get access to that are the ones that are trusted, right? That, have, that, that should have access <coughs> to that, is that correct? <coughs> that is correct, and just to add a little bit more to that, with your Nitro instance itself, 
even if you trust us, we don't have access to your instances, so that's already taken care of. And then beyond that, you may have users, even admin level users, who have access to your instances, and if you want to, if you want to fence them out, that's where you provide yeah, that. In that scenario, you're not trusted, right? You're 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 blocked. Right? We are blocking yeah. ourselves out of there. Like right. your, you know, the the way way I like to describe it, and it's my personal opinion here, but your data is radioactive to me. We don't want to get anywhere near it, right? And that's how we treat it. Yeah, yeah. It's like when somebody tells me, "Well, I have this confidential information. So don't tell me. I don't <laughs> want it." You know? Yeah, I, I was telling it. somebody yesterday. It said somebody walked up to me, and asked me, "Hey, Arvind, how confidential is confidential computing?" I said, I can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go through a customer use case if yep. we can. So let's say, uh, you, you guys talked about banks before. Yep. Uh, so I'm a bank, you said, let's say 10% of my data is in the cloud, I want to put you know, another, I don't know, 30, 40% into the cloud. How do I do that? Who's, who, first of all, who's watching? How do you guys work together? What are the integrations? Let's go through the sort of use case. Yeah, maybe I can talk about a specific use case we actually uh, worked on with a, with a large bank. Uh, it's, it's a top 20 bank, and the, the use case was uh, super interesting. Uh, basically, they had their core banking application running in a mainframe, uh, and it, essentially the mainframe became a bottleneck as more and more users started using the digital experience. And it caused them two issues. One was the latency started going, going up and beyond the SLA of what they promised their customers because the, the mainframe was a bottleneck. And the other issue was the cost per transaction started going up in a, in a massive way. Uh, and what they decided to do is they wanted to use AWS and essentially put on uh, like, call it a caching mechanism in front of the mainframe to take care of these transactions and then sync it back to the mainframe you know, once a day uh, uh, just to, to sync it back to the core banking uh, uh, application. Uh, so they've built all that, they got it ready to, to put on top of AWS, but then security and privacy got in the way. And the reason it got in the way is because this caching mechanism is, is, is processing PII data. And basically both internal regulations as well as external regulations, uh, there's a regulation out by the bank uh, from the, the Bank of England, uh, PRA, that talks about protecting data and use in the cloud, that basically blocked them from putting it in the cloud. Uh, and what we come in with on Juno, so obviously AWS provides Nitro enclaves to, to help solve this problem. Um, the issue that many customers run into is that uh, if you want to use Nitro enclaves, you have to re refactor the application. You have to rebuild it you know, for the Nitro system, and that's where Anjuna comes in. We essentially build a software stack to, makes it, to make it super simple to take any, any workload, any piece of data, and run it in confidential computing environments uh, without any changes. So you don't, no need to change the code, no need to recompile, and that's exactly what we've done with this bank. We enable them to take that uh, caching mechanism and put it uh, in AWS with no changes, which in terms of what they achieved, one is the cost per transaction went down significantly, and then the latency went down from over two seconds to about 40 milliseconds. Why was the mainframe a bottleneck in that scenario? Can you explain that? Yeah, it's, it's this, uh, because everything has to eventually get to the, to the mainframe. All the data has to be stored there. And then as, as the number of transactions went up, they have uh, about uh, 50 million uh, users uh, that were using the, the digital experience, it just became, everything had to go through that one bottleneck to the mainframe, and just the mainframe just wasn't, uh, they, they essentially, the, the two options they had was either scaling the mainframe, which it would have been about a $100 million project, Okay. Obviously they didn't want so to do it. <laughs> gas, basically the mainframe. And <laughs> now, much. was data coming in from different locations, or was it, is it? Uh, yeah, it's the core banking application. Everything eventually yeah. gets to the mainframe. Right, okay, so they okay. So they, they would have had to buy another, whatever, Z20 or something. And exactly. 100 million it would have cost. That was, that was the numbers they shared with us, which is obviously not something they, they wanted to do. And, and the cloud is the perfect, you know, is the perfect solution for these types of use cases if you have the right security. That's interesting, because I have talked to over the years a lot of banking customers and mainframe customers, they would buy a new mainframe sight unseen because they could make a business case on it. But if you can use the cloud as a caching layer, mm -hmm. <laughs> the business case is way more attractive yes. uh, exactly. for this use case anyway. Exactly. And you said latency went down to, you said two milliseconds? Uh, uh, 40, 40 milliseconds from about uh, two seconds. So, so 40 milliseconds from two seconds. And the cost per transaction, can you repeat that one? You yeah, the cost per transaction, uh, basically when the mainframe became a bottleneck, the cost per transaction went up significantly. Yeah. Uh, and that just went down with the with this caching mechanism. Okay, so you also mentioned that you, you, you ha prior to Anjuna, you would have to make changes to the application in order to take advantage of confidential computing. Is right. that, did I understand that correctly? Maybe yeah, I'll so add a little bit of color to that. Right? Yeah, has that been a blocker? Yeah. I mean, please. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not necessarily a blocker, it's, it's the considerations that you have to take into account when you're using a technology like Nitro Enclaves, right? Are you building your application from ground up or are you trying to repurpose what you have? 
if you're trying to repurpose what you have, that's really where you're thinking about, hey, do I, how do I lift and shift this without making any changes, without refactoring this, right? Versus if you're building it ground up, then you know the rules you have to work with. But regardless of which situation you're in, if you don't want to use a building block and build everything all by yourself, Anjuna can actually speed it up for you by reducing your time to market because they have a solution that can help move it faster than you yourself building it. So yes, there's refactoring involved, but that's involved when you already have code that you want to repurpose. Is there, is there an analog with like a Graviton, for instance, in order to take advantage of Graviton? You really want to optimize, you got to th you think about how to take advantage of it. Um, is that similar, sort of, or, or, or is it different in that, like can I run, I can run workloads, Right, it's just I, I can't necessarily have them optimized for co confidential computing, existing workloads, or do I actually have to make changes to the code to take advantage um, of it? You do, well if, you, if you're using existing code, you do have to make changes. Yeah, okay. Uh, but Graviton may not be the best example to compare yeah. here, because oftentimes what we find is customers who are migrating to, to ARM, to, to Graviton, uh, are either moving all the way from on-prem into the cloud and directly onto Graviton, or from say x86, instances into Graviton. So the considerations that are in play over there are a little bit different from yeah, the okay. considerations that we okay, have here. But so, yeah. Okay, but so the, the bottom line is that there's things that have to be done for, for existing apps yes. yeah. uh, that you don't, obviously don't have to do them for, for, for Greenfield right. apps. So how, does, how do you do that? What's the magic in the <laughs> inside yeah. the covers there? So, so generally, and, and, and as Arvind uh, said, uh, today if you want to use you know, uh, Nitro Enclaves, you have to recode the application. If you're already in the process of recoding, maybe you want to do this, but in many cases, the, the engineers are not necessarily security experts, and you want to kind of let them do what they do best, and then you can sort of come, you know, after the fact, just run everything in Nitro Enclaves with no changes, which is the, the solution we provide, not to mention if you have any legacy application, things that you already wrote and you don't want to change, or third-party applications, if you want to run in Nitro Enclaves, this is exactly where we come in and help. Uh, the way we do that is that we, maybe just go one step deeper into why you have to recode. Uh, with Nitro Enclaves, uh, basically you have sort of two, two pieces. There's a piece running inside the Enclave, which is sort of the core of what the application does and that's protected, and then you have all the communication that's happening with the outside. And obviously that's something that uh, you don't want to enable that within the Nitro Enclave. So essentially you have to almost like break the application into two. A piece that's doing the core of what the application does and a piece communicating with the outside, and then you have this connection between the two. And, and that's what you need to do yourself if you refactor the application. Or with us, what we do is we take the entire application, we run it inside the Nitro Enclave solution, and then we become the slayer that sees, oh, the application's trying to communicate with the outside, we're going to uh, take that and make sure that it's being handled properly as it moves to, to the outside. So again, it's just completely from the outside with no changes. So it sounds like a perfect partnership. I mean, you guys love this, because you get yeah. more data into the cloud yeah. faster, yeah. Right, with less friction. <coughs> what kind of integrations do you do you have to do, have you done, you know, do you need to do in the future? Yeah, so that's, that's actually where I think uh, uh, you know, additional benefits uh, comes to play, because obviously we've partnered very closely with AWS to, to be able to, to connect this to the Kubernetes service of AWS and to the, the key management service of, of AWS. And basically we, we integrate with the different uh, um, you know, systems and solutions AWS provide to fit it into an enterprise environment. Because a lot of these, again, these large banks or these large financial services, or large organizations are using all these services and fitting into the ecosystem of a large, you know, of a large company is obviously very, very complex. Which is one of the, the, the challenges uh, that we see when people try to build it themselves. It's not just around recoding the application, which is usually hard enough on its own. <laughs> it's, it's integrating with all these other solutions that is also a challenge. And we've basically taken all that you know, pain away just to make it super simple. I've always been, I mean, I have to tell you, I've always been skeptical because Amazon has a, you know, the mainframe migration program. I've been very skeptical of that because it's hard to migrate COBOL. Uh, <laughs> but I, I love, you. maybe you have a different perspective on it, Arvid, but I love the fact of being able to extend the useful life of my existing mainframe and save $100 million. That's, that's real business value <laughs> to me. So. Yeah, we, we see this often with uh, traditional banking institutions, right? They, they have APIs that have worked for a decade. Nobody wants to go touch it. Yeah. They know it's working, they know it's secure, now they just want additional security enhancement there, right? And this is where I want to connect the dot with the earlier question you asked, Ayal. Like, what is a security enabler? You know, how, how, you know, how, do, how do you look at this? PII is not new to the cloud. It's existed in the cloud. But there are a lot more regulatory compliance pressures, everything that, that these institutions are starting to you know, have to consider as, as they move more and more workloads into the cloud. And that's really where this big security becomes an enabler, where by 
deploying these solutions, by ensuring the isolation, by ensuring there's no operator access, there's no insider access and whatnot, these workloads are coming to life in the cloud. The data itself has been there but what you do with it and how much more you can do with it, that's really the enabler that security. I think it's a really <laughs> legitimate, uh, defensible premise that you're making sec security an enabler because you, know, you think about when you're developing a new application and you're all excited and you're focused on the functionality, you're working backwards from what the outcome is. And you're, honestly, you're, you're, you're not, you're not I mean, you're, you're embedding certain aspects of security but at the end of it all, there's that last mile you got to get through compliance and audit and the security team, the SecOps team, all that. <laughs> yes. And if you can remove that, that is, takes, takes away friction, it's an accelerant to time to market, and there's, a, I think, a big, big win for customers. So guys, yeah. congratulations, I'll give you a you know, last, last word. Yeah, I, th I think uh, where this is eventually going is once you have solutions like Nitro Enclaves, there's really no reason not to use it for everything. This is a layer of security. I, I think unfinished computing is just going to become computing. Kind of like how HTTPS became mm. security for, for everything. And I think this is where the world is going. I think this is the right direction the world is going to. And I think it's going to make all of us more, more safe and secure. Yeah, it's, 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 it's inside, a little inside baseball here, but super important. Guys, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. It's great Thank to see you, you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. All right, enjoy the rest of the show. All right, and <laughs> keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante, John Furrier, and I will be back right after this short break from RSA 2023. We're in Moscone West and we're live. Be right back.